that this story deals with a question of water, but more accurately, it deals with many questions of water. Where to get it? How much is enough? How to transport it? How to finance these and related operations? Such questions face every populated area, vital questions on which depend its food, its drink, its comfort, its health. Its safety. Its industry. Its beauty. Its recreation. Let's see how these problems apply to and are being met by a particular geographic area. Specifically, Onondaga County, New York, and its chief city, Syracuse. Unlike less fortunate parts of the world, North Central New York does not lack for water sources. From the picturesque Finger Lakes, sizable Lake Oneida, to the clear running rivers, and inexhaustible Lake Ontario, the area is most generously endowed with water. But Onondaga's thirst is great, increasing in proportion to its population growth of nearly 30% between 1955 and 1965, and to its additional industrial demands. A conservative estimate of today's per capita water requirements is approximately 180 gallons daily this figure may increase substantially in areas of heavy industrial consumption. So if we were required to provide our own supply of water in the good old-fashioned way, each of us would have to dip up and tote 19,000 buckets of water yearly. That's the way it was done in Onondaga County 150 years ago. Although you can bet that neither individual consumption nor personal hygiene approached present-day standards. As a matter of fact, such standards could not exist today without the miracle of modern waterwork systems. A well-documented history of local water supply development can be seen in the film The Prosperity of Water. It deals in part with the establishment of the first reservoir and the construction of pipelines leading from sources in Lake Scaniatlas and Lake Otisco. Initiated before the turn of the century and built up to a capacity of 66 million gallons per day, the system served a rapidly growing Syracuse admirably for over 60 years, but a vastly enlarged city plus 12 additional towns and 19 villages requiring water supply by 1960, strained the system's resources to the limit. Even prior to this time, local authorities foresaw an upcoming water shortage. In 1959, the Joint City-County Water Committee, later called the Onondaga County Water Agency, was set up to study the problem. Agency members retained the consulting firm of O'Brien and Gear to make studies of available sources. Earl O'Brien and Walter Neubauer, partners of the firm, here flank Glenn Ostrander. When the Metropolitan Water Board was later formed, Mr. Ostrander was named managing director. The engineering firm's report showed legal restrictions to further tapping of Scaniatlas and Otisco water. Oneida's water would require considerable treatment as would the waters of the Oneida and Seneca rivers. The Salmon River or Lake Ontario were the final choices, 
with the Nod going to Ontario for several reasons. Lake Ontario represents an inexhaustible supply of high quality water. Also, the city of Oswego agreed to share its ample intake facilities at a fee far less than the cost of building a new intake. The proposed pipeline route passed close to several towns in Oswego County, which desired to purchase participation in the supply. It also approached Syracuse from a direction well suited to distributing water to Onondaga County. The advantages of the Lake Ontario supply system were widely publicized in a remarkably effective program. Influential citizens, citizens' committees, direct mail, newspaper campaigns, radio and TV were all marshaled to produce maximum impact. So successful was the campaign that over 60% of the voters at a special referendum in July 1962 approved the necessary $45 million bond issue for the establishment of a Lake Ontario supply system. Here's what Governor Nelson D. Rockefeller had to say on the subject. Almost everywhere I've traveled, throughout the state or throughout the country, as a matter of fact, people are faced with the same problem of water pollution and today, with the drought, water shortages. It's indeed gratifying that here in Onondaga, and that in New York State, the citizens and the government have been working to meet and face realistically this problem. In Onondaga, the new water system will bring ample water supply uh, by 1967. In the state, we have a program which will go to the voters this fall for a billion dollar bond issue to help the local communities to meet the sewage disposal plant cost and the interceptor system. This kind of forward-looking, realistic planning is what is going to preserve our greatest heritage in the supply, the abundant supply of water for the people and for future generations to use, whether it's in recreation or in community consumption or in industry where it is so vital to expansion and future job opportunities. Thank you. To administer the project, the Metropolitan Water Board was established. This group was responsible for guiding the entire project to completion. Counsel for the body is Thomas Dyer on the far left. Next, board member Leslie Deming, Vice Chairman John Farrell, Chairman Thomas Smith, and board members Robert Heisel, Stuart Pomeroy, and Elmer Bogardus. Another member, John Ivanizek, was not at this meeting. As previously noted, Glenn Ostrander was appointed administrative director. Nearly two years were required to resolve certain legal complications. At the same time, the route of the pipeline had to be determined, and rights of way had to be obtained through the hundreds of properties involved. The right of way then had to be surveyed, boundaries defined, and the line carefully staked. During the same period, the engineering of the pipeline and attendant facilities was finalized. This involved complete plan and profile of every section of the line. engineering drawings of countless structural details. And the production of final specifications and contracts. The consulting engineers determined that a 54 inch trunk line with supplementary lines of 48, 42 and 36 inches would provide an ample supply for the growing demands of the area well beyond the year 2000. International Pipe and Ceramics Corporation, popularly known as Interface, was low bidder on pipeline materials for the project. County Executive John H. Mulroy, seated left, signed the contract for the county, and Vice President C. Mac Albertson for Interface. Subsequent months saw furious activity as plant erection raced rapidly approaching winter. 
Interpace purchased a 28-acre tract of land north of Syracuse and immediately set about surveying, pouring foundations and erecting buildings at a rate that saw a modern concrete pressure pipe plant ready for operation by the end of the year. The company's decision to establish a local manufacturing plant was in itself a considerable boost to the area's economy. It created over 100 jobs for local labor, which would never have existed had the pipe been shipped in from outside. Local companies supplied many of the concrete pipe components, stone and sand. Cement. Local services and utilities also participated in the new business. New families came to town. Key personnel of Interpace took up residence in houses near the new plant and settled down to make Onondaga County their home for the duration of the project. They patronized local supermarkets. Shopped at local retail outlets. Enjoyed family dinners at local restaurants. And participated in community activities. In short, Interpace became a working and contributing part of Onondaga County. Returning to the Lake Ontario project, the pipe specified was lock joint, pre-stressed concrete embedded cylinder pipe, shown here in its four structural stages. Steel cylinder and joint rings. Next, this structure cast into a concrete core. Then the core reinforced with high tensile steel wire. And last, the completed pipe coated with dense cement mortar. In spite of their size and weight, a 54-inch pipe 20 feet long weighs 10 tons. This pipe is made on a production line basis. This mechanized monster peels sheet steel from a coil, shapes it to a cylinder of the proper diameter, spirally welds it, then cuts it to the exact length required. The steel bell joint ring and spigot joint ring are welded to opposite ends of the steel cylinder. Then, because this steel structure represents the waterproof membrane within the pipe, it is hydrostatically tested under pressures inducing as much as 25,000 pounds per square inch in the steel. Even the smallest pinhole leak is repaired by hand welding, and the structure is tested again until proven completely watertight. The cylinder is then settled over a smooth steel inside form and held concentric to it by a carefully machined base ring, over one flange of which the bell joint ring fits snugly. After the steel outside form has been lowered around the cylinder and clamped accurately in place, the cylinder is ready to be embedded within a wall of vibrated dense concrete. During the casting operation, care is exercised to admit the concrete between the forms slowly and evenly so that the spaces on both sides of the cylinder are equally filled and compacted.
As those areas are gradually charged, the forms are rapidly vibrated by high-frequency vibrators to assure maximum density and a good finish to the concrete. After careful curing, the concrete core is wound with high tensile steel wire at high uniform tension. This tension is accurately maintained and recorded throughout the operation. Uniform spacing of the wire is achieved mechanically according to conditions of design. To complete the pipe, rich cement mortar is applied as a protective coating over the wires. Minimum thickness of this coating is 7 eighths of an inch. The mortar is sprayed at high velocity by means of counter-rotating brushes, thus producing an exceptionally strong, dense exterior envelope for the pipe. Installation of the pipe and construction of other facilities was let in several separate contracts. Various contractors worked simultaneously on the sections of the work awarded to them. The first section of the pipeline was begun in the fall of 1964, and the last was completed by the summer of 1966. Pipe was loaded at the plant, two sections to a trailer. Each section was carefully blocked and chained to the trailer bed for its trip over the road and the right of way. It was unloaded at the ditch site as close as possible to the point at which it would be eventually installed, within easy reach of the equipment used for laying the pipe. The trench to accommodate the pipe is usually excavated to the proper width and to approximate grade by means of a pull shovel, although a clamshell or drag line may be used for unusually deep or wet trenching. Final grade is established by hand, as is any special bedding which may be required. Before installation, the finished grade is checked with a laying square to assure level bedding. A round rubber gasket is snapped into the groove of the spigot joint ring. The gasket is then lubricated with a vegetable-based soap. Compressed between the close-fitting joint rings, when the spigot is forced into the bell, the gasket forms a watertight seal between connecting pipes. The pipe is then swung out and lowered into the ditch with a crane. The bell joint ring of the pipe already in place is also cleaned and lubricated with soap. The lubrication substantially reduces resistance to pushing the spigot home into the bell. The spigot of the pipe being installed is aligned with the bell of the pipe in place and partially entered. A cross timber is placed over the open end of the pipe and attached by cable to a winch several joints down within the pipeline. By taking up on the winch, the spigot is pulled completely home into the bell. The pipe's position is then carefully checked for line and grade with relation to previously established grade stakes. As added protection to the exposed portions of the zinc-coated joint rings, the small opening between connecting pipes is filled with rich cement grout. A cloth band anchored astride the joint permits filling the space completely around the pipe and holds the grout in place until it is set. After the grouting operation, the pipe may be immediately backfilled. Final fill and surface grading is usually done with a bulldozer. The 
the project continued through snow and freezing winter weather. Through spring rains, which turned the trench into a sea of mud. Through dusty, searing days of summer. Down hills and around curves. Even under rivers. Two major rivers had to be crossed, the Oneida and the Oswego, each about 700 feet in width. At these points, a reducer and a Y split the 54-inch main into two 42-inch lines, which were laid under the riverbed. Similar fittings on the far bank brought the twin lines back to a single 54-inch main. The riverbed trench was excavated with a clamshell and an unusual flying drag line guided on a cable spanning the river. The cable, centered over the desired trench line, permitted accurate excavation from bank to bank. Much of the riverbed was of solid rock and had to be blasted by an underwater demolition team. The subaqueous pipe incorporated a harness at each end, which permitted underwater assembly by bolting together opposing lugs on connecting pipe. Pipe was slung with extreme care to assure that each set of lugs would accurately match the position of those on the pipe already installed, to which they will connect. The pipe is swung from the barge and lowered beneath the river into the trench. A diver, in communication with the crane operator by telephone, guides the pipe into place, passes the bolts through opposing lug holes, and by taking up on the nuts, draws the joint securely home. Meanwhile, another team was busy constructing a treatment plant not far from the intake. This point was selected to provide purified water for communities along the pipeline route who wish to share in the supply. Other teams built three pump stations, one to draw water from the intake, another to pump the purified water from the treatment plant, and a third to relay the water to the end of the line. Gradually, the line neared completion. In less than two years, man produced a mighty underground river harnessed within walls of corrosion-proof concrete and capable of delivering to thirsty Onondaga County 36 million gallons of water daily, much of which will be impounded in this reservoir on the outskirts of East Syracuse. Finally, the last two sections of the line were linked with a closure piece, and the Lake Ontario water supply pipeline was ready for service. Soon, nature's carpet will cover most man-made scars, leaving little evidence of a vast engineering project. But though unseen, for generation after generation, the system will serve new residential communities, industrial complexes, shopping centers, schools, and recreational facilities in thriving, ever-growing Onondaga County. And all this was made possible by forward-looking citizens and officials who faced and solved the knotty problems involved in a question of water. <laughs>